Well, we'll call a meeting to order. This may be the first time we've started a minute early, so welcome everybody. Uh, special welcome to our new employee group who we just, uh, some of us met with, heard about their histories and uh, uh, welcome aboard. And I think you'll all enjoy the experience. Uh, it won't be without its challenges, but uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we need to uh, have a motion and second to grant a leave of absence to Commissioners McDonald and Saruta, who are both out of town. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? So that motion carries. Um, and I need a, a good morning. So um, I hear traffic is bad. Um, we need a motion and second for approval of the minutes of the uh, commission meeting of August 9th. So moved. Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. And uh, Curtis, executive director's report. Now that you've been on the job for eight weeks, what is it? Is it eight weeks? Uh, yes, it's uh, 73 days, 11 hours, and 16 minutes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Again, welcome to the new employees. Great to spend some time with you earlier this week and briefly this morning. Uh, it's just a, a great uh, privilege to have you all on board and uh, really want to welcome you. Um, also, I'd like to note our safety champions up here, some a uh, few familiar faces um, for the commission. But again, really just want to emphasize there are folks in all parts of our business who are really focused on safety and uh, making sure that everyone who comes to work here every day goes home uh, uh, safely and uh, better in the way that they arrived. Stan, are you ready with a safety message for this morning? I am. So with all of the uh, natural disasters that uh, we've been seeing in the United States, I wanted to take time to talk about uh, family and personal preparedness. And uh, this month, September, is National uh, Preparedness Month. Um, and its key focus is on, <clears throat> excuse me, planning, uh, and its general theme is disasters don't plan ahead, you can. And I think we can all see by the devastation that we saw with Harvey, uh, Hurricane Irma, and especially what our own citizens in the state have been going through with these forest fires, why it is so important to, to be prepared for emergencies. And so I wanted to take some time uh, to just talk about some basic steps that we can all take uh, to be better prepared in, in the case of an emergency. Uh, first of all, build a preparedness kit, and a great tool for this is the Red Cross uh, resource guide that is available on their website. Uh, it has great information in there on how to put together a preparedness kit. Also, keep an emergency kit uh, whenever, uh, wherever you spend time, whether it be in your car, at home, or at work. Uh, create a family emergency communication plan, and this is really important because a lot of times you will be separated and it's important that you're able to get in contact with each other. And so uh, put the important numbers in your kids' backpacks, uh, have them placed at home in a location that everyone knows, um, and put it in your emergency kit as well. Uh, and then it's important to identify an out-of-town emergency contact to, uh, ahead of time. So this is something that you can do now, talk to one of your friends or whatever, on, so that every family member uh, knows who they can get in contact with to coordinate information. Uh, take an inventory of your resources. It's important to, that you know what are your food resources, what are your water resources, what are your sheltering resources, um, and what are your health and medical resources. Uh, all of these are important. Uh, other advice is to check in with your, with, with your neighbors and to understand uh, are there any special needs in the neighborhood where you may need to be providing assistance to people uh, during an emergency. Uh, practice your preparedness plans with your family uh, is extremely important. And also they recommend that everyone should kind of take a first aid class because first responders may not be there and it's really important that people have these skill sets uh, in case uh, of an emergency. So, you know, it's not, it's impossible to predict when an emergency will happen, but we can all take steps to be better prepared when they do. Terrific. Thank you, Stan. Yep. Um, 
I'll note in the sort of the category of natural disasters, uh, we have just a world-class fire department out at the um, Portland Airport Fire Department, and they helped over the course of the past two weeks in the regional response to the Eagle Creek fire. Uh, we deployed um, a reserve engine and a crew of four to the Multnomah Falls Lodge and uh, helped successfully protect the structure from um, the wildfire destruction. Uh, we're also continuing to stand ready to support additional efforts out in the gorge. Uh, hopefully those efforts efforts are, are beginning to reap some benefits. It looks like they are slowly getting control of the situation. Uh, at the airport, uh, we just had a great time last week celebrating the fifth year in a row of the um, Best Airport in America Award from Travel and Leisure Magazine. For my part, I got to uh, hand out donuts and uh, um, $5 gift certificates to um, airport staff. So those are not our staff, but uh, folks who work over at PDX who, who really make the place what it is. Um, we surprised folks at uh, baggage handling and uh, TSA. I got to stroll into a TSA staff meeting uh, and hand out donuts, which is something that not everyone gets to say. Uh, we visited with the rental car folks, uh, maintenance workers, uh, and, and took a bunch of treats out there essentially to say thank you. And uh, we're just really proud of, of that five years in a row. Uh, and uh, in the category of Bill always made this job seem so hard, and it seems pretty easy to me. Yesterday, I got to have salt and straw ice cream. Um, so first Blue Star Donuts, then salt and straw. Been a really rough week for me. I gained about 11 pounds. Um, we, um, we created in conjunction with salt and straw a, uh, a PDX ice cream flavor. It's called... I have to get this right. It's not storm water. It's rain water and spruce tips. Uh, our former <laughs> city staff over there is shaking her head. Uh, in conjunction with Salt and Straw, um, we're launching today um, at, I believe, at 11 o'clock over at the airport at both Tender Loving Empire and Country Cat, this Salt and Straw flavor. It's just a fun way to celebrate and welcome the folks who are here visiting for Feast uh, here in Portland, which is running all week. Uh, tens of thousands of visitors and really wanted to just emphasize this local feel that we have at PDX and our emphasis on, on local flavors. Uh, I got to taste it last night at a KGW live uh, TV show with my kids, and we couldn't let, get them to say anything uh, about the ice cream, I think because it's a unique adult flavor. Let's just say that. Um, it is remarkable, and I hope everyone gets a chance to taste uh, the new uh, ice cream with salt and straw. Um, on the eclipse, we talked about it a lot as we were leading up to it. Uh, we now have had a chance to look at the impact uh, it had at the airport. As you may recall, we talked about 17,000 rental car returns uh, in the course of a couple days, which is in comparison to a busy week, which is 5,000. Uh, the team and uh, all of our partners on site did a, just a great job. Hopefully you didn't hear anything about it, which uh, in airport life is a good thing. Uh, more than 1,000 people donned uh, Eclipse glasses and watched from out here on top of the parking garage. Um, additionally, Alaska Airlines, as you may recall, flew uh, a eclipse watching um, flight out of PDX and uh, just, I think, really emphasized how great it was to be here for that event. Um, there was a remarkable amount of swag sold. This is something I think we hadn't predicted, but uh, if not the biggest week ever at PDX, it was near the top $3.1 million in sales, 23.5% increase over uh, a year ago, same week. So uh, a lot of t-shirts saying uh, my parents went to see the eclipse and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Um, on the Marine side, um, through the Regional Area Maritime Security Committee, the Port of Portland won a $1.25 million matching grant to rebuild key components of our security system at T4 and T6. Uh, specifically, this funding will go to renew security cameras and associated architecture. It's uh, a great support for our effort on the Marine side. Um, and thanks again to Commissioner Pierce for her leadership of the Industry Leader Committee. Uh, we've had our, our second meeting and are now later this month scheduled to have our third uh, to really focus on return of container service to T6. And then finally, uh, commissioners, you'll have a, a packet in front of you. Uh, I believe I've mentioned it briefly before, but 
Um, the uh, Governor Brown has um, begun an effort to really look at reducing the overall cost of the PERS liability to the state. As we are a PERS employer, we are a part of that conversation. Uh, she has assembled a task force to seek to find $5 billion of uh, assets in state government that might be used to buy down the overall liability, which is around $23 billion. That task force has now convened a couple meetings. They have two left. Um, they're really looking at redirecting one-time funding, not to bend the curve really, but to lower the overall amount due. Um, we've received inquiries from the task force about port assets, and our responses are in front of you. Uh, just wanted to be sure that you saw what we're sharing. We'll also be, uh, there are some of the copies here at the back of the room if the members of the public are interested. We'll also post it on the website. Um, in short, our response has been to be as uh, open as one might expect from a public organization. We share any information that uh, is possible to share. But we also want to emphasize that a lot of the complicated assets around the port are in service of a public mission. And simply putting uh, mission-oriented assets on the table to achieve other objectives is only a part of the conversation. So we're going to seek to maintain the conversation around the benefits our assets provide to the community and, and to the region. Um, and finally, um, the task force I mentioned has two more meetings and uh, we'll come back if there's anything additional to, to tell you. You'll see a, a range of questions in that packet around things like privatization of assets or selling of what might be called surplus assets. And um, as with most things at the Port of Portland, um, when you dig a little deeper, things get pretty complicated pretty quickly. So please let us know if you have any questions about the task force or its work. Uh, Mr. President, that is the sum of my report. Thank you, Curtis. Any comments or questions? Uh, is there a motion and second to approve the executive director's report? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So that motion carries. Thank you. Uh, good report. Thank you. Uh, and Stan, thanks for that uh, advisory. I, f I find your little um, pieces of recommendations each month really interesting and helpful and a good reminder to all of us. Uh, we don't think often enough about anticipating what could happen, so thanks for that. Um, this is a, the period we've set aside now for anyone in the public who wishes to make a comment. If I don't have a an indication here that anyone has signed up, but if there's anybody out there, this would be the time. Um, in the absence of uh, somebody stepping up and saying something, we'll move on. Uh, I think Vince, uh, you're going to talk about uh, wildlife at the airport. Good morning. Good morning. This is really a follow up to. Uh, brief discussion that we had at the August Commission meeting uh, about the management of the federally listed streaked horned lark on port properties. And so we thought it'd be a good idea to come talk about our wildlife program here at the airport. Um, it's really uh, an, an extensive program and we do it uh, really to manage the risk to aircraft and wildlife, not just birds, but all kinds of wildlife that uh, is here. We do it through a, really an integrated strategy. There's lots of operational things that we can do. Um, adaptive things with the habitat and so on. Um, so we asked uh, Nick Atwell here, he's the manager of the wildlife program, and I would say Nick is really a, a, one of the most foremost experts actually in the United States on this program. We're consulted frequently on how we manage this, and I think we've done some really uh, great things uh, both for the airport, but also out in the community uh, to to engage on how we manage the wildlife. And again, it's all around a safety um, program. So I'll let Nick go from there. Great. Good morning, Executive Director uh, Robin Hold, uh, President Carter and Commission member members. Really appreciate this opportunity to give you a quick brief of the program. So we're just going to kick it off. So this is going to be a snapshot of the program. I won't be able to address everything, but by all means, I would invite you afterwards to, to come and visit us and uh, learn more about the program. So the program is built on four pillars. So the first pillar is the short-term operational strategies. This is the day-to-day -day stuff that all of the staff is doing out there. So the intensive hazing, trapping, and translocation. The second pillar, research development, prey-based studies, and other research as needed. Right now we're banding streak-turned larks. 
The third pillar, the long-term management strategies. This is a really important piece, the compatible land use planning. We'll touch on that next. The information education, this is where we visit other airports. We invite other airports to come visit us, exchange of information. So we're always uh, continuing to uh, excel. So compatible land use planning is an important component of any successful aviation wildlife management program. You've seen this slide uh, last month, but I really wanted to point out our intent is to manage species where they're not in com conflict with other land uses or aviation safety. So in order to do this, we did submit a plan to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, a habitat conservation plan, and we obtained the incidental take permit in June of this year. This is a rare video that captures a uh, an engine ingestion of a green heron. This aircraft was able to land safely to the airport that it departed from. But other airports or other flights have not been so successful. This of course is one of the most famous bird strikes to date. We've had engine ingestions here too as well. So this was uh, in January 2001, this aircraft ingested one gull, a uh, very common gull, a herring gull. So it had to abort takeoff. The engine was completely destroyed. Uh, many pieces left on the runway. And of course the runway had to be closed for a great length of time. So this is all based on phase of flight. It's really important to note that on takeoff is one of the most dangerous t uh, phases of flight based on uh, just essentially kinetic energy, speed of the aircraft and mass of the bird that it might ingest or hit. What makes PDX so complicated is that we're located on the Pacific Flyway for migratory birds. Then you add in some of the eco-regional context being on the confluence of two major river systems uh, abundant open space, government island, uh, very green. And then when you add in the urbanization to the south or all borders, I would say, and the, also the golf courses makes this a really attractive piece. Then you bring it back home to PDX on a very local scale where you have navigational aids that act as high uh, perches, hunting perches. When you have high hunting perches in a abundant food source. This is a really attractive airport to raptors. Not all birds are a high concern. So what we do is we rate them based on probability of occurrence and severity of impact. The probability is how often are those birds struck at PDX. The severity piece is a national database piece where how often are those birds causing damage to aircraft throughout the country. Wanted to point out the red-tailed hawk is one of our highest risk species. So we've started up a, you'll notice Curtis in the upper corner. He's, uh, I brag on that yeah, he likes to volunteer from time to time. Uh, so we had to start up a, a red-tailed or a, a raptor trapping and translocation program. So the 19 year stats you see, we've seen, we observe over 100,000 raptors here. Um, there was 123 strikes and to date, we're just over 1,600 uh, trapped and translocated uh, of all raptors. We're we're approaching 3,000 that have been trapped and translocated of 13 different species. So it's not just red-tailed hawks or falcons. So we do catch a number of owls too, as well. So the red-tailed hawk was so abundant here at PDX that the 142nd fighter wing had these birds perched on the tails of their aircraft, F-15s. They embraced this and actually are now using it as one of their logos, being the fighting red hawks. Some of the traps that we use, we use two traps primarily. One is called the Swedish goshawk trap. It's a uh, passive trap on the left there. The one on the right is uh, a BC trap. It's a, both of these use lure animals. The difference of the one on the right is it's uh, kind of a tarsus snare trap. The marking techniques that we use, we wing tag all of our red-tailed hawks, 
transmitters is part of the R&D pillar, the research development pillar, and then of course all birds that we've uh, trapped and translocated will receive Tarsus bands. We also have nesting uh, resident hawks on, on or around our airport, so we do intervene with these nests so we can actually pull the kids out of the nest and uh, take them to other areas where they'll be more successful to learn to fly and hunt on their own. So the next gen piece would be to use uh, drones to help assist in this monitoring. So example of nest uh, translocation, or I'm sorry, nest intervention. These birds are taken to Savi's Island where we have flight cages that we maintain uh, with uh, ODF&W, so uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, Portland Audubon are also partners in this. From there, after they have learned to successfully fly and hunt on their own, they're taken to suitable relocation sites. So you have high uh, vertical perches being a natural landscape with the trees and abundant open space. We're also taking them across the river now. Uh, in partnership with Alaska Airlines and uh, Seattle. So we're flying our birds up to Seattle Airport and then we're putting them on the bus and we're taking them just uh, northern Washington at the border of Canada. To help inform what we're uh, doing as far as translocation sites, uh, we've developed a, uh, a web page here. This is our ability to engage the community to help us determine which sites are more successful than others. There's a lot of community members that are very interested when they see a, an orange wing-tagged hawk. This will give them the ability to search by that band number or wing tag and learn more about that bird. And of course the data comes back to us because they help us. So we've learned that we've had our birds go from uh, just uh, actually, there's been several in Canada, too, as well, all the way down to uh, Mexico. But some do come back. That is the reality. But I would say that these stats would suggest that this translocation program is successful when the percent returned that were struck is 2%. So we are moving a lot of birds here. Even though that we have 26% that are moving on the migratory flight path, the ones that are returning are still a, a minor piece of that, the 2%. So switching gears a little bit, habitat mount, uh, management. This is primarily goose management. So the area of 33rd Marine Drive, it's a large open space. Geese love large open spaces because they can't identify predation and they don't have time to actually flee from that pred predator. So what we're doing is we're using visual barriers so they're not able to see on the other side. This level of uncertainty kind of puts it into the uh, those goose, those geese uh, mind that it's not a good spot to be. So we're taking that to a natural landscape. So this is just right out front of HQ. We converted this site from a parking lot to a vegetated area with raised berms. Without these raised berms and vegetation, this would be just one giant green space in between two active runways. So we wanted to make sure geese weren't coming there. So when you're seeing this, this time of year, this vegetation has grown to the point where geese can't see on the other side of it, and it works the same way as that sill fencing and visual barriers. Very successful. All the plant material, Inside the airport plan district is abiding by our airport landscape standards. And just to give you an idea, the bird species that were struck here in last year. So red tail hawks, in, definitely in the red. So what we're trying to do is manage all, all species, but we put most of our resources to the high risk species. Not all bird strikes cause damage. So in 2016, we had 92 bird strikes, two of those caused damage. And you can see over the course of the year, what we're really after is decreasing any damaging events. I'm well, welcome to take questions that you might have. Questions, anyone? 
So, Nick, tell us a little bit about your background and what got you here and doing this. I started working at the port um, quite a long time ago, I'd say 99, and I was an intern from Mount Hood Community College. Um, eventually got hired on as a, a natural resource technician, and I've been a part of the program ever since 99. Um, and now all of my staff is hired from the same internship program from Mount Hood Community College. So, Great. Well, thanks for the information. It's a fascinating program. Yeah. And good Thank luck you. on uh, keeping the numbers down. Thank you. So, Kristen, you're next on the agenda here. Okay, I have to admit that there's no worse place to be on an agenda than following Nick Atwell talking about our wildlife program as we talk about enterprise zones. So I'm very aware of the fact that this isn't going to be nearly as cool as what you just watched. Um, we wanted to uh, take a minute to talk about enterprise zones. Over the years, you have seen kind of on the agenda, there are a lot of consent items around enterprise zones. And what we thought is today would be a great opportunity to just give some background, kind of the what the program is, who are the players, all that good stuff. So we have Emerald Bogue here um, uh, to talk through this program. And Emerald is our government relations manager with all the regional and local government relations. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Thanks for having me. Um, Enterprise Zone Program. How do I advance the slide deck? Oh, am I clicking the right thing here? Left. Left. There we go. All right, so just taking a step back before we get into the Gresham specifics. Um, Enterprise Zones are, it is an economic development tool um, created by the state of Oregon. It allows for a property tax exemption on new capital construction uh, for three to five years in exchange for some things. And so we'll, I'll go over a little bit on, on what those things are, but the program is run by Business Oregon. So the state sets forth some requirements that kind of serve as a table setting. These are basic requirements and it comes down to more jobs with staying power in, in local communities. It has to increase full-time employment not by a lot, but it has to increase it. And those jobs need to stay for the duration of the tax exemption. Um, that increase in employment can't be at the cost of other jobs going away outside of the zone, right? So if a company has multiple sites in the state of Oregon, they can't boost employment here in Multnomah County and take, take jobs away in you know Medford. Um, they have to enter into a first source hiring agreement, and that's an agreement that says we're going to hire people from the local community. Now, if the businesses apply for an exemption beyond three years, and three years is considered the standard exemption, the state gets into the wage zone a little bit um, for years four to five. And that is that gets a little more complicated and has a lot to do with urban zones versus rural zones. We are an urban zone here. so. That is that it is less relevant for what you guys often see. Local requirements, and those are set by zone sponsors. Uh, the requirements vary depending on the jurisdiction, and that is generally where the wages play out. Um, each local jurisdiction, they, they set the zone, they set a map, and they're able to say, here's what we think the right standard is for job quality. And these are just a few examples. Um, all of the examples are usually some variation of a percentage of the minimum wage. Um, that, that's Gresham's approach. There's Hillsborough's approach. There's a new approach um, pending approval at the city of Portland. They're going to go to a more simple version of $15 an hour for all employees or a total compensation of $20 an hour for all permanent employees after one year of employment. So. This is really up to local communities to set the right balance of what they think is raising standards. But again, the, the program only works if it's attractive to companies, if they're willing to use it. So it is a, it is a balance that they have to strike. Boop. There are changes on the horizon. And uh, for the Portland Enterprise Zones, there are two Portland Enterprise Zones, one called the Portland Enterprise Zone and another one called the East Portland Enterprise Zone. 
Both are overseen by Prosper Portland, the organization formerly known as PDC. They are going to be changing their program a little bit. They're going to uh, have a boundary amendment to uh, include Old Town, the central east side industrial area, Terminal 1, a reminder that's not us, and Terminal 2, and yes, that is us. Um, they are updating the wage requirements in light of uh, increasing the, the state's increase in minimum wage. But I think the most notable thing that they're doing is they are strengthening the use of public benefit agreements. Previously, public benefit agreements were only used for boundary amendments, so anything that's been outside of the zone. Going forward, they're going to have a program where these benefit agreements are used for anyone who wants to use the program. Uh, there won't be one agreement, um, it, and it could be on anything. It could be on a variety of issues, everything from internships to procurement to using office space. The reason they want to do this is they're finding that companies want to work with the community but they need to find tangible ways to do that. Um, and Prosper Portland wants to be a good matchmaker um, to that regard. Each agreement will be customized going forward. So this is pending approval, and you will probably see this on the October consent uh, agenda. There are 12 enterprise zones within our jurisdiction at the Port of Portland. Um, so you're used to seeing these, I mean, let's see, Malala Enterprise Zone, Hillsborough Enterprise Zone. These have all been on the consent agenda as any time there's a change, a redesignation, a reauthorization, um, a boundary amendment. State statute requires coordination with port districts, not just because we forego some amount of tax revenue, but really to coordinate economic development activities. So what you have in front of you today is Gresham's. Uh, the Gresham Enter Enterprise Zone Boundary Amendment. Um, we have a really strong working relationship with the city of Gresham. Their program has been in place for 11 years, many approved applications, a lot of local investment. Today's action actually brings uh, a lot seven of the Gresham Vista Business Park um, into the Enterprise Zone. What's driving this change is that um, that lot had been zoned uh, corridor mixed use and they are changing the zoning to general industrial. All industrial sites in the city of Gresham are in the enterprise zone to incent development and job creation. So as they are moving forward this zone change, it makes sense to make it consistent with every other piece of industrial land in Gresham and to put it into the enterprise zone. And we recommend doing that. Here's a little map. Um, and I guess I'll, I'd say, you know, in closing, I think that the Enterprise Zone is a really good program because it does a couple things. One, it attracts, it, it attracts employers. It is a tool that brings companies to town. But two, it, it gives local communities some control and say over the things that matter to them. Uh, job quality, local investment. Just in 2015, um, the, and these are Prosper Portland's numbers, in 2015, uh, the Enterprise Zone program yielded $91 million in local purchasing because they were able to come, come uh, incent that with a program. Would some of that happen otherwise? Probably, but it gives local governments the ability to make sure that first source hiring agreements happen and all kinds of other standards that are important to them. So I think it's a very good program and we're happy to support it. Questions? Ha happy to answer questions. Comments. I have a question, but I, we can vote on this first. But don't leave after that. Uh, is there a motion and second to approve the recommendation? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed. So the motion carries. So Emerald, I assume that in these enterprise zones, it's important what other jurisdictions in the Northwest or West Coast or whatever are doing to compete for these businesses assuming some of them are new businesses coming in as opposed to existing businesses expanding. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any sense of, are we competitive or are uh, enterprise zones competitive with other states uh, that are in our region? I probably can't answer the question super well as it pertains to our, whether or not that makes us competitive with other states. And I might look to, my, uh, to Kristen. I, I can say that it helps 
One of the things that um, we will do as a follow-up to this presentation is get some information um, from Prosper Portland, maybe regional, um, some of our regional kind of business economic development partners and see what sort of research they've done and what we are competing with in the Northwest. So we're happy to pull together that information. It's, you know, just send it to you and share. This is what we do know. I think of um, GPI, Greater Portland Inc. They probably have some great research. Yeah. So we're happy to get that. I mean, it's you. not obviously don't go a whole bunch of work because we're only some of the input that would yeah. make a difference in what's being offered. But I'm curious as to how we stack up against other jurisdictions. Absolutely. You know, it, Mr. President, if I could, I, I think what you'll find, and uh, we'll certainly get the data on this, but regionally we're competitive. I'd say the regional players at, at a local level uh, in these enterprise zones and across the river are in the same kind of zone. What we are not competitive with nationally is the larger, um, like the Enterprise Fund in Texas, which is a right. multi-billion dollar subsidy set up by the state to bring business to Texas. We just don't compete in that way, and neither does Washington. We just don't have the toolkit for that. But in terms of a regional competitiveness, I think we are. Uh, Idaho has similar tools as well, uh, and their their local governments have regional tools that, that work similar to ours. So in our 11 or 12 regional enterprise uh, zone entities, it's kind of equivalent. You saw a few of those examples. There's a little bit here and there, but there isn't Absolutely. one that's a you know, great leap forward th uh, than others. We are not competitive on larger subsidies with uh, other national players. Okay. Yeah, as I say, don't go to a whole bunch of work, but it's- I think there's probably yeah. a lot of work happening right now as we're trying to attract some big um, yeah. entities coming to the Portland area anyway. So my guess is some of this research has already been compiled yeah. and we're happy to share. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next item is um, mine, I guess, uh, <clears throat> and a, sometimes a favorite, but a little background. So this is our opportunity as a commission to set goals and objectives for uh, Curtis as executive director. And we do this each year, We've done it for, I think, all the years that I've been on the commission. And um, it's a it's a it's a great opportunity and it's also something that we committed to do uh, as Curtis was being hired because we'd been through this process over the last year of finding out um, both in our own uh, port district as well as around the country with different applicants for this job what the expectations are of uh, executive directors and what's unique to Portland uh, and the Port of Portland, and and how are we, uh, how can we be helpful as a commission to Curtis to get him off on the right foot in terms of what are the opportunities and the responsibilities uh, within the port as we look at uh, the business side, um, the organizational side. Uh, the community side and uh, the employees of the port and the interested parties, whether direct or indirect employees here uh, at the airport and in our marine industrial um, responsibilities. So um, what you will see when you look at what's on the paper, will you, you certainly will see that there are areas of special interest and special concern, special commitment that we intend to make uh, going forward. Um, we've, we've done this work um, through uh, me, uh, Pat McDonald, commissioner who is not here today, who's done a ton of work both on this and uh, in the uh, hiring process, as well as some of our commissioners who were engaged in that interview process and the hiring process. And um, then Bobby Stedman, who has worked um, diligently through all of this right up to the present. And we committed to a couple of things. One, as we, as we are always committed to setting goals and responsibilities that are the, I won't say 30,000 foot level responsibilities, but they are the stage from which 
all of you and others who are port employees uh, take your direction. So it's an important piece of where is the team headed and uh, how are we on, on the commission's part defining that. And then more specifically, uh, within those areas of focus and concentration, what are the uh, take-home responsibilities that Curtis will have to drive to achieve those more general goals? And, and adding that layer of specificity is not, has not yet happened to the extent that we would put it on paper, but it will. Uh, we've committed within the next 30 days uh, to have the specifics built around these general responsibility areas. So I'll, I'll just walk through these. I'm, uh, I'm not big on um, PowerPoint, so um, I think we'll get to see what's in black and white on the uh, performance criteria. And, and I will mention a couple of things uh, that, are, that maybe need a little further explanation, and then um, we, we will take any questions, comments from other commissioners, and then uh, approve those, hopefully, as the guiding principles for Curtis's first year, and, and, uh, and some of them, obviously, are going to extend uh, beyond one year, beyond two years, maybe five or ten years. So uh, if we could look at up on the screen, what are the items, or do you not have those? Okay. You don't have them? Perfect, because then I can just highlight what I want to here <laughs> and keep everybody else a bit in the dark. But, so the categories uh, generally are, one, organizational effectiveness and excelling at organizational effectiveness. Now, for a lot of people, um, that may not have any meaning if you haven't been part of or uh, participated at a leadership level in a large organization like the Port of Portland. Uh, first off, that means for a new person coming into a job, it's their opportunity to set the tone as to what's the organization going to look like over the next few years. Who are the most important leaders? What are their roles? How are they going to fill those roles? Um, how are they going to be accountable so that what they do in their part of the organization blends well with the overall responsibility for uh, the direction of the organization? So uh, in that category, just uh, generally, um, outreach to port stakeholders. We've, we've talked a lot about not just the city of Portland, not just our local interest group, uh, like um, the, um, what started out, the Port Noise Advisory Committee, uh, but everybody who is touched by the port. And we learned a lot in the process of hiring that there are people who feel uh, appropriately involved in the port as stakeholders, uh, and attended to, and others who are stakeholders that don't feel uh, attended to at all. And so that's all part, whether they're local governments, individuals, interest groups, whatever they are, that's high on the list. Um, equity uh, and diversity strategies are in the organizational structure category. Um, Curtis will be rolling out more detail, uh, certainly in that program over the next 30 days. Um, organizational structure we've talked a bit about, uh, but specifically around equity and the uh, capital improvement projects, construction projects at PDX. All of those affect er everything and anything else that we wish to do uh, as a port. And then uh, kind of following up on Stan's report this morning, uh, workplace safety and employee health. We've, we've done, an, uh, I think, a very good job in the last few years of focusing employees on taking care of themselves so that they can help the port take care of itself. And uh, I think those programs have been very successful. And I would say in this category as well that Curtis in his first 60 days, 72 days, whatever it is, uh, I think we've been impressed, uh, I know I've been impressed with his outreach to different uh, folks in the community as well as uh, the employees to, to f try and figure out uh, what it's going to take to be an effective leader in this role as executive director. And uh, so I think he's off to a good start in that regard. 
Second large category is drive regional prosperity. We, of course, are, see ourselves and I think others see us as, if not the most important driver of the economy of Oregon, we're certainly one of them uh, and a very important one. And we need to continue that. And part of that regional prosperity, um, which you may not think of in this fashion, but is work on the Lower Willamette Superfund site and cleanup and getting that activity actually in motion uh, we now have the EPA's final uh, statement, record of decision on the matter. Uh, there's a lot we can do that we are doing. Curtis is driving this uh, at a pace that uh, we haven't had before. I think that's a great opportunity for us. And then again, uh, it's this relationship uh, both with the City of Portland and others in business uh, as well as uh, livability issues here in Portland. How do we make Portland, Oregon, and the port's influence area a better, more successful uh, business uh, uh, program? Uh, third category, general category, is connect people and businesses to markets. Uh, Oregon, as you all know, uh, certainly as port <coughs> employees you know, is a trading state, and uh, trading is a global enterprise. and uh, what everything and anything that we can do to improve that, uh, make it more responsive to the people who live here, work here, and have an interest in what we look like as a state and a city, uh, that's critically important. And that means creating jobs, uh, helping to others to create jobs, uh, business enterprise zones, any and all of that. Um, air service is obviously uh, an important piece of that. We've had a lot of success over the last few years of getting more service, serving critical areas uh, around the world, and we need to maintain that if we want to be successful in our contribution to Oregon's prosperity. And the last is, uh, not least, but last category is deliver an ex outstanding experience um, at PDX for passengers. and. Uh, this is something that we talk about a lot. We get awards for what we have done, um, but we can't stand still on uh, expanding programs that have been successful. Uh, part of this will be uh, the construction that's going to occur on the terminal. Um, part of this will be uh, the rental car facility that's almost complete. I know we've got the, the uh, facilities uh, I've, I've seen just sitting around waiting for people to come in at the airport. We now have an area where you can get services locally and, and uh, the, I don't want to say, I'm not sure if it's 7-Eleven, but it's, it is, it's yeah. that type of uh, business that'll be great to have. Um, and, and that means working with the airlines as well as uh, our public here. So it's a good list. It, I think, addresses the things that are critical uh, to have our attention directed toward. We have people today, we didn't, but we oftentimes almost always have uh, people that are stakeholders or part of our public coming to talk to us about what we are doing well, uh, not doing so well, or not doing at all which is great input to have. Um, and I think Curtis will tr continue and improve on the tradition of making sure we're listening to the right voices uh, at the right times uh, and how they impact uh, our direction here at the port. So uh, with that, uh, comments or questions from the commission, um, and there will be more, as I say, more work to be done uh, on Curtis's part. Yeah. I am. Um First, I, I think it is a very well documented and orchestrated set of expectations, and I, I want to commend you and Bobby and, and Commissioner McDonald. Um, and I think it, it's, it's, I view it as foundational. This is new leadership at a new period of time in the, the history of the port. Um, and I think as we go forward year after year, there will be greater and lesser of um, areas of accomplishment. Some lend themselves to shorter period of times, others are a long trajectory. Uh, at, at some point it would be very, it may be helpful to look at, at weighting of various elements as you look at the length of time that we may be looking at. There are some things where I'm sure Curtis has an expectation that this time next year this will be done. There are others where we will be along a path 
and if there was some way to sort of differentiate that, because I, I really want there to be an acknowledgement of what's been accomplished and a recognition of what still needs to happen, and there might be a way of just framing that, and I'm sure, they, I'm sure Bobby is translating what I'm saying, um, but from a starting point, I could not, I, I, I couldn't envision um, a more articulately scoped set of expectations for the first year. Uh, well, th thanks for that, and uh, on behalf of all of us who have participated in it, but uh, I think it's an excellent point, and I think that what we will see within the next 30 days or so is some of the specifics that um, there should be some things on that list that uh, dictate identifying a particular action to be taken within a short period of time that we can look at a year from now and say, okay, you did it or you didn't do it, or here's why or why not. Um, not everything's going to lend itself to th that sort of specific, but I think part of our mes message, hopefully, to those who look at this, who are stakeholders or employees or whatever, and say, what am I doing? What can I do to help move this forward? And, and if we get everybody moving in the direction that Curtis wants to take us with our approval, then we should see more and more of that specific or specificity that will that'll be directed at these targets. So good comments. Anything else? Uh, motion and second to approve uh, the goals and objectives for the this year. For I Curtis. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, and we'll be back at this. Uh, Curtis, I should add, is a very willing participant, a participant in this process. So um, looking forward to great things out of the next few years. Did I have a choice on being a willing participant? Uh, well, you do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you may not have more than a few years. Be short, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Stan, you're the next on the list here. Thank you, President Carter. Uh, we are here this morning to seeking approval of a fuel procurement contract uh, for a fuel supply for the Dredge Oregon and for all the other equipment that we use in the dredge operations on the Columbia River. A um, little bit of uniqueness about this agreement is that uh, the Dredge Oregon is a non-self-propelled uh, vessel. And so that does require these fuel deliveries to happen shipside. They come via a barge, a fuel barge, um, and it happens anywhere we are along the river. Uh, so the contract uh, provides for deliveries directly to, to the vessel. Um, the other thing that you should know about this is that it is uh, these costs associated with this uh, contract are fully reimbursable under our contract with the Army Corps of Engineers. And here today, uh, presenting the agenda item is Doyle Anderson, uh, the head of our navigation uh, department. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Commission. I'm here to request the approval to award the sole source contract for fuel supply to the Dredge Oregon. Uh, they're the Rainier Petroleum is the only company that has the ability to provide this service on the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. And as Stan mentioned, since the dredge is not self-propelled, it's much more cost-effective to take the fuel to the dredge as opposed to taking the dredge to the fuel. Um, the cost to, the, the daily cost for the dredge is about $80,000 per day. And it doesn't take long to pay for that when you consider the delivery charges for fuel. It's somewhere in the order of 6,800 to 19,000 for a fuel delivery, depending on where we're at on the river. In May of this year, the port solicited bids for this contract. Rainier was the only supplier that responded and they objected to the port's termination clause. So the port canceled the port's Solic the public solicitation and the Corps approved the port's determination for a sole source contract with Rainier. There was no change in fuel prices or costs during those negotiations. It was strictly about the termination clause in the contract. Excuse me. 
Our contract is for a five-year term with a $200,000 limit on any single purchase. The pricing of the fuel is, is based on Opus and the an Opus daily index along with the delivery charge and taxes. And uh, for at the current pricing, I'm projecting that we'll spend about 1.5 million on fuel this year. And we're reimbursed, reimbursed directly from the Corps of Engineers and that after we use the fuel. So, <clears throat> so I'm asking for your approval to award this contract to Rainier Petroleum. Thanks. It any sounds questions? like we don't have much choice. <laughs> <laughs> there are not any other choices um, that I'm aware yeah. of. <laughs> so questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, just curious, curious, is it off-road diesel? Is it red or green? Or? It's red. Okay. Yeah. It's, we're, and we're paying about $2 a gallon right now with the delivery charges and taxes and everything. It's like a really big tractor to burn that much per day. It's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. So is there a motion and a second to approve the recommendation? No second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck with that stuff. Thank you. Uh, Vince. Morning. We're here for a construction contract amendment to the Taxiway B Center and Exits <coughs> Rehab project to place an airfield electrical line here and you might wonder what does this have to do with the parking garage and um, rental car project and a quick turnaround area but those projects are over a significant amount of the utilities uh, here at the airport and so now is the time to be moving utilities while we're in the midst of these projects and so what we're doing is moving this one here to relocate the primary south airfield electrical line before we finish and get started on all the other projects uh, in that area. And so Chris Edwards is here to talk about this amendment. Thank you, Vance, and good morning. Today I'm requesting approval to award a contract amendment to K&E excavating on the Taxiway B project in the amount of a little over $1.2 million. This shows the overall project location, which is essentially right outside our window here. Uh, the work that's before you today is what is shown in orange. I was before you earlier this year to award a contract amendment to place casings and conduit in support of the parking and consolidate rental car facility or better known as Packer. So the first part of that, um, well I should say as you might recall, um, as Finch just mentioned, within the facility there are these two lines. One is the PPNL line, which is our terminal power, and the other is our airfield lighting. And those do need to be relocated in order to construct the new facility. And so we've finished the relocation or placing of the, um, pow the casing and conduit, and now we need to relocate that power service. And so that is what is before you today. And last month, you may recall that um, the PPNL contract was awarded, which is shown here in the red. We chose to use the Taxiway B project for a number of reasons. Um, we have a contractor and subcontractor already mobilized on site. Uh, the subcontractor is specialized in airfield um, electrical construction. Uh, it minimizes operational impacts um, because you have just one contractor working on it versus multiple. And also, lastly, there is a cost savings with this approach. This shows the overall project schedule. This work should be completed by the latter part of October this year. This is the contract amendment and funding source. So here's original contract to K&E. Um, and then again, I mentioned that earlier this year we did the casing contract amendment. The one before you today is bolded for the actual electrical work. And then um, change orders to date, these were done through the executive director's delegated authority. This will be paid for by the packer out of the port cost center. And staff requests approval, executive director's recommendation. Questions? I had just one. I, and I can't find it in the notes, but I think in reviewing the materials we received before the meeting, was there not a small business set aside on this contract, or was there? There was a small business for this contract. This 
particular piece of work doesn't have small business, but the overall contract had 9%, and actually currently we're at 14.4%. Okay, so this will be included within that contract. That number. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if there if the expanded scope gave opportunities for participation of small business. This scope doesn't have, um, this particular contractor, subcontractor is not a small business contractor. Okay. And they are not working with other entities as well. This is exclusively being done by a single contractor. I can't eat. By K&E, um, right. and their, their electrical subcontractor. Okay. So are you clear after that answer? I, I am. I, 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 what I'm hearing is that this work is reflected in a larger contract and scope of work, so it doesn't have to be isolated for that yeah. reason. But I, I remember reading something that specifically said, because of the limited scope of this work, that there was not a small business target that had been set and I just wanted to understand that okay. but it's being it's it's reflective in a larger metric right. okay so so I have just a general contracting question here we do contingencies on the original contract right and we've done now a significant amount of change orders here is that are we within the contingency or are we outside of it how's that happen well in this particular contract this is being paid for by the parking consolidated rental car facility so it's coming right. out of that budget for the taxiway b project we we do have contingency set aside and so that money they're separate funding sources i don't know if that but I answers don't, it i don't but. think we've had to take anything out of contingency out of the packer project to pay for this work. This is part of that what is, was in the scope yeah. of the work so to be done. A different category. Correct. For a different yeah. So we haven't had to do anything of, out of, yeah. it, it knew it needed to be done. It's just more efficient from a contracting standpoint to do it okay. here. Okay, gotcha. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, motion, second. Okay, uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'm missing it in the reading, but just wanted to uh, double check. So this is just for excavation or this is for it says casings is that the the electrical conduit this, placing that in the ground and this is actually just for the the conductor the wire oh for I pulling see. all the right, wire right okay perfect thank you that's it motion second all those in favor aye, aye. Oppose. Motion carries, thank you. you know, an awful lot of digging out there around the <sighs> rental car facility. Here. There is. <laughs> and speaking of digging, uh, we have some maintenance dredging to do at Terminal 4. This is our bulk cargo and autom uh, automotive terminal on the Willamette River. Uh, we have Kinder Morgan who is here, who runs a soda ash facility, berth 410, 411. It's part of our lease. We're required to maintain the berth uh, to the 40 feet. The last time we did this was in 2013. There's been new sediment built up, and so over time we, uh, we watch that and uh, take surveys, and uh, it's time for us to get in there and uh, get it back to its uh, appropriate depth for them to operate. So Mars Hill is here to present a recommendation for a dredge contract. Yeah, thanks, Vince, and um, welcome. Um, yeah, as Vince said, this is to request a uh, amendment to an existing contract for maintenance dredging at Terminal 4. Um, this picture here shows the Kinder Morgan facility, which is at the northern part of Terminal 4. Um, leads to Kinder Morgan, they operate a soda ash export facility from this berth. So T4 is located on the Willamette River, and um, besides several bulk cargo tenants, uh, also serves for exports of automobiles, Toyota. Um, here's a picture of the typical equipment used for our maintenance stretching at our uh, port terminals. This is clamshell dredge, so a floating crane, clamshell bucket, dredging the sediments, putting it in the barge, and then hauling it off. The initial contract for this work was advertised and awarded earlier this year, but uh, since then some changes have occurred, which triggered the need to change the scope of work for the contract. 
So now we're getting to why um, we need to amend this contract, um, which is really for the following two reasons. First of all, we've had an unexpected increase in uh, volume of sedimentation, uh, likely due to the, uh, the prolonged high water uh, period this spring and summer in the Willamette River. Uh, volume went up from an estimated 3,000 cubic yards to almost 7,000 cubic yards. The other reason is uh, due to some regulatory issues, as explained in detail in the written item. Um, because of that, we had to change the disposal location of the sediments to a uh, solid waste landfill. So this contract amendment, if approved, would address both of those changes to the scope of work. So schedule of the project depicted here, um, assuming approval today of this contract change, dredging would take place next month in October, which is also the last month of the regulatory in water work window. So as far as the project budget, 1.5 million total um, contract amendment fits in um, as shown here. Um, the budget uh, also contains another $180,000 of contingency, which is about 12% and considered reasonable for the, uh, the, the state of the project we're in right now. Um, oh, the other thing as far as the note here at the bottom, because uh, dredging uh, requires very large equipment and uh, almost all the work is self-performed, the um, contract does not lend itself very well for small business participation, so because of that no goal was set for this contract. So with that, um, the executive director's recommendation is to award the contract as described. Questions or comments? Is there a motion and second to approve? So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. That's the end of it. Just like that.